Good morning. Glad you guys could join us on this Mother's Day 2022. Just want to wish a happy Mother's Day to all the mothers. My mother's here today, so if uh, you see your mother, wish her a happy Mother's Day. If you see somebody else's mother, wish her a happy Mother's Day. The wonderful thing about church and this whole child of God and God is our Father is that it actually does bring us together in a radically new social experiment that until 2,000 years ago had never occurred. The idea of a cross-cultural, uh, trans-tribal family made up of people who share no blood and yet share the fatherhood of God. It's a whole new concept, and so I wish all the mothers in here uh, whether natural-born children or not, a happy Mother's Day. God has given us so many mothers. Speaking of a mother, we are actively praying right now for one of our mothers in the faith, Margaret Emerson. She is stuck in Italy with COVID for the last uh, two week and a half. They were supposed to come home last week, and Martin is with her, an anniversary trip. So they are over the worst of it, but waiting a clear test. So we'll continue to, let's continue to pray for them. Uh, a couple other announcements today. Um, Jeff and Sid are away at a funeral this weekend in Chicago, and uh, so I know many of you have been wishing them well. You continue to do that. Um, we um, have next week is our women's breakfast coming up. So if you, you saw the, the sign up in the foyer, yesterday was our first men's breakfast since the pandemic. So great to see you guys out there. And then coming on May 20, Friday night, is our whole new event we're doing called Rise Up. Uh, it's no secret that uh, uh, COVID made a dent in a lot of churches. Many churches shut down. Our church sort of conserved resources by just having our staff carry out as much as we could. But it's time to rebuild, to rise up. And so Rise Up is a, tra- a spirit empowerment night that we're going to do many months. It'll happen in May, probably June. We'll skip July, move to August. But it's an opportunity to be trained in the gifts of the spirit and to be envisioned, encouraged, inspired to to take that into whatever sphere you're in. We're hoping a few of you will step up and take that into our kids' ministry, into new small groups. We've just been seeing God do awesome stuff in this last season uh, in some of our groups and and just uh, our Connect class and seeing God just really draw in a whole new wave of people that uh, he's brought here to help us you know, move this church forward into greater and greater uh, just tasks and be in the hands and feet of Jesus. So that's coming up March 20. We hope all of you will join us Friday night, 630. I think that's about it. Oh, May 20. What did I say? Oh, we can't go back to March. No, we definitely can't go. Lord, help us if we go back to March. Well, I think that's it. Yeah, I think that's it for announcements. We're going to dive right into our, our message today. Um, we're doing a series I'm calling Right Sided, um, and uh, just exploring the ways that uh, Christianity and, uh, has changed our world. It's been slower than we thought. You know, it's, it's taken a lot longer for the great tree Jesus promised from a mustard seed to grow or the leaven to spread through, through the dough, but uh, God is on the move and has already changed so much of our world. Most of the time, we don't even notice it. But first off, back to mothers. Today is a celebration of... Uh, mothers, but it's also a celebration of motherhood. And it might come as a surprise to you to learn that motherhood is much more than human nature or mere biological instinct. The sort of motherhood that we're celebrating today didn't arise from sheer animal instinct. In fact, motherhood as it's practiced in our culture today is is a strange phenomenon in the history of the human species. You know, if you had a mother who loved you and nurtured you despite your gender or your practical usefulness to her, you're part of a rare subset of humanity. And to understand why, I need to tell you a very sad story um, about how motherhood works elsewhere in the world. To appreciate what God has done, we have to look at the darkness we've come from. It's a tragic story, but it's, it's tragically too common a story of of how parenthood has been practiced for much of the history of the world. The truth is that motherhood we celebrate today is neither common practice nor common sense in many parts of the world. Now, one of the writers that explores this is an Indian-born American named Vishal Mangalwadi. He's a historian who writes on the history of the Western world, 
um, and how the Western world has influenced the development of his mother nation, India. And early in his career, Mangalwadi was a, was a humanitarian aid worker working in rural India. And he writes about him and his wife's first year working in a rural village in 1976. Mangalwadi and his wife, Ruth, were visiting every family in the village that they could. And they happened upon a family with a young daughter named Sheila, who was very near death. Um, at 18 months old, she was, they said she, Sheila looked like a living skeleton, uh, two weeks to swat flies away, buzzing around her. And Mangalwadi said, when we saw her, we just we started to cry. Uh, it was heartbreaking to see. Uh, and we asked her mother, you know, what's, what's wrong? We asked her father, what's, what's the problem? And they said, she doesn't eat. Uh, she doesn't eat. She vomits everything she's given. And they said, well, why don't you take her to the hospital? Well, we, we can't afford it, they said. Uh, well, Mangalwadi said, well, we'll pay for it. Uh, but, but we don't have time to go to the hospital, the parents said. I have three other children to care for, uh, you know, the, and a husband to look after. And so the Mangalwadi said, no, 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 we'll hire somebody to look after your children. Oh, but we couldn't repay the debt. No need. We'll, it's a gift. And finally, the, the parents, uh, you know, just shouted, why are you bothering us? You know, we don't have the money, the time. And Mangalwadi said, we looked right at him, and we said, are you trying to kill your child? And in the end, what one of the neighbors convinced the parents, if you don't go with them to the hospital, the police may launch an investigation that's going to cost you far more money. And so the parents relented. Mangalwadi and his wife and their aid workers took Sheila to, to a hospital. She was there for a week, put on feeding tubes, several weeks at the Mangalwadi home in resuscitation, um, and now she was fully recovered. So eventually the parents came for Sheila, and the Mangalwadis, you know, purchased milk and food to send home with her to ensure that she'd continue to be fed. But after a month passed, they did a home visit and discovered Sheila was again dying of malnutrition. So again, the Mangalwadis took her to the hospital, and they nursed her back to health. And again, they returned her to the family. This happened three times, and on the third time they arrived to find that Sheila had died of basic malnutrition. In fact, her parents watched her die. And worse yet, they allowed it. Now why? Why would a, a mother and father do such a thing? Well, Mangalwadi writes, Sheila's parents really starved her to death because they saw her as a liability. They already had a daughter to babysit their sons and to clean and cook for the family. A second girl was an unnecessary burden. They would have had to feed her for 10 to 12 years. They would have needed to go into debt to find a dowry to marry her off. The, then she would have returned to deliver her children, just adding to the expense. Why would they take on this lifelong burden, even if someone was offering free medical care and milk and food for a few weeks? He continues, for a person unfamiliar with the Hindu worldview, it'll be hard to understand how parents could kill a child with the implicit consent of the entire village. They fail to understand the power of the mythology of reincarnation and how it trivializes life and death. He writes, Sheila's parents could not understand our compassion on their daughter. They did not understand our compassionate impulse because 3,000 years of Hinduism, 2,600 years of Buddhism, 1,000 years of Islam, and a century of secularism had collectively failed to give them a convincing basis for recognizing and affirming the unique value of a human being. Now, for most of us, a story like that is just unfathomable, isn't it? I mean, unthinkable. It just seems hopelessly backwards, barbaric, completely upside down. But what you need to understand is that you are the strange ones. You are the peculiar people. You are the ones who are backwards to most of humanity that has ever lived. You are the ones that are upside down. And uh, friends, we have been, our world has already in so many ways been right-sided, turned right side up by the, the coming kingdom of God that uh, many days we just don't even notice it. For most of human history, humanity has accepted infanticide or leaving your children for dead as an acceptable parental choice. It's, it's, 
astonishing, isn't it? For so much of history, you know, it, today in much of the world, it's, it's common sense that, you know, parents should provide for their children, not leave them for dead. And yet for most of human history and most other cultures, killing your children was an acceptable practice. So what changed? It's not as if humanity just woke up one day and decided, you know, that children were precious and should be protected at all costs. So what happened to convince us that, you know, mothers should, should uh, not leave their children for dead if they prove inconvenient? What changed? What happened? Well, friends, Christianity happened. Christianity happened. 2,000 years of Christian influence has convinced much of the world today that infanticide is a crime, it's murder, that every life is precious and worth defending and protecting. You see, you live in a culture that has already been right-sided, turned right-side up by Christ in generations of his followers. And of course, people still argue you know, about what, what constitutes life and when life begins, but humanity has come an awful long way in 2,000 years. Christian influence has been spreading so slowly for so long that most days we don't even notice its influence. We take for granted that parents should provide for their children. But the sacredness of human life is not common sense. It's it's a uniquely Judeo-Christian thought. And that idea did not spread overnight. It was much more like the tree, Jesus said, begins as a small seed and grows. And if you've ever watched a tree grow, what do you know? You can't see it growing, can you? (laughs) Much of history has been like that. Uh, In fact, it took centuries before Christianity made this idea of parental responsibility, of the sacredness. of It took centuries before that idea even took root. You realize what an unlikely probability, though, that it is that you've even ever heard these ideas? That you've, an unlikely improbability that you've even heard of Christianity? I mean, 2,000 years ago, Christianity was a tiny, tiny sect of Jewish people that believed they'd found the Jewish Messiah. And that after his public execution, they saw him raised back to life. Now, best estimates are that there were at most 1,000 people from the start, probably 500, maybe less, that actually devoted their lives to following Jesus because it was a totally preposterous idea. As the Apostle Paul admitted, he said, you know, the the news about Jesus was culturally offensive to Jewish people, and it was was foolishness to, to the rest of the world, to Gentiles. So what could possibly convince anyone to rearrange their lives around an executed criminal. Well, you've probably heard the the theories. I mean, some people claim that Jesus' first followers were just duped. Perhaps they'd had some mass hallucination. Perhaps they saw a ghost. Perhaps it was a conspiracy. But none of that explains how Christianity grew from a few hundred people to over six million people in less than 300 years. Before it was even made legal, Christianity became the majority religious faith in the Roman Empire, the largest and most powerful empire ever on the earth at that time was swallowed up by the influence of Christianity while it was still illegal. So how did that happen? Well, there's a lot of theories that historians have examined, um, but one of the most convincing theories of how Christianity grew and grew and grew exponentially, is that Christians treated wives and mothers and daughters and babies better than anyone else had treated women in the entire history of the earth. That's one of the reigning theories, that Christians treated women better than anyone ever had before. It's true. Christianity completely overturned the world's expectations about how women and children should be treated. And so dramatic was the difference in the early church that the, one of the best historians of that era, uh, uh, a sociologist named Rodney Stark, claims that even without any other changes, um, in any other differences 
in the early church. The popularity of Christianity among women can account for nearly all of the exponential growth. Nearly all of it. In fact, the early church was so attractive to women that in AD 370, the emperor Valentinian issued a written order to the pope requiring that Christian missionaries cease their outreach among pagan women. It was just a runaway success, and he knew it. Now, to understand why Christianity was so popular among women, you have to understand that the, the ancient world was a horrible place for women and children. Now, probably no surprise there, but in the ancient world, no one considered women equal to men. Nowhere. You know, and in many places, women were treated as mere property. Now, the Greco-Roman world was a little better. Um, there's accounts of women owning property, and it varied from place to place. And yet, mostly, women were considered the property of their fathers and then husbands. And it's not as if they could do anything about it. Women were bound on pain of death to marital fidelity. They were married off by their fathers. And, you know, men, meanwhile, in the Roman Empire, they... They did whatever they want. They slept with whomever they wanted. Um, they, they, it was considered perfectly acceptable for men to gratify themselves with slaves and prostitutes and other men. Now, it, it, not that there were many women even around. In the ancient Roman Empire, the best estimate is that there were about 140 men for every 100 women. I mean, men far outnumbered women. Women were in short supply. And why? Uh, historians of, you know, why, why so few women? I mean, that's, biology doesn't work that way. And the answer is mostly infanticide. And to a lesser extent, abortion. Very few families in those days chose to raise more than one daughter. Estimates are less than 1% of families had more than a single daughter. You know, infant daughters were routinely left exposed to die, you know, thrown in, in, in lakes and sewers. They've, they've even found archaeological evidence. You know, beyond that, abortions left most women that received them infertile. And so by the end of the, the empire, Rome was, you know, just facing a, a, a crisis in their population. Even, even though great philosophers like Plato and Aristotle, you know, who we revere, had advocated for infanticide, by the time of Jesus, it was not working out so well. The Roman Empire was declining. They couldn't replace people that were dying with the plagues. Their, their population was shrinking so rapidly that they were forcibly relocating immigrant barbarians from Europe. Into, you know, into, into the Roman Empire to compensate. They were forcibly conscripting barbarians into Caesar's own army. They were levying taxes on unmarried and childless people, but giving free land to anyone that had more than three children. And with so few marriage-eligible women around, in ancient Rome, the, the average age for women declined to, or the average marriageable age for women declined to about 12 years old, but was often much younger. Now, it's not that everybody got married. Um, the, the Caesars had to try to pass laws to force people to marry. Uh, but, but many men just carried on, you know, getting their, gratifying their lusts wherever they wanted. And so the Roman Empire died the, the long, slow death. Uh, that, uh, that, that arose from their own choices, which made, made the ancient world a terrible place for women, just awful. And in many regards, the Jewish world wasn't a whole lot better. I mean, the Jewish world didn't allow for infanticide or, you know, and required marital fidelity, but women were treated as inferiors in almost every area of life. Women weren't allowed to read scripture or learn the scriptures. They at the synagogue, women couldn't speak aloud. Women who went to the temple were restricted to the outer court of women, which was about five steps lower than the court of men. The rabbis said, when, when a boy comes into the world, peace comes into the world. But when a girl comes, nothing comes. I mean, these, are, these books still survive, uh, you know, the Mishnah and the Talmud and some of the oral law, that, uh, rabbinic law. Um, you know, the, the, one rabbi it's notoriously said, even the most virtuous of women is a witch. And the Mishnah, which 
this collection of law books uh, instructed men to avoid women, even in, you know, especially in public, saying things like, who speaks with much with a woman draws down misfortune on himself, neglects the words of the law, and finally earns hell. And so men were, Jewish men were even cautioned from talking to their wives too much. The Proverbs of the Father, which are not the same as these Proverbs, advise men not to speak much with women. The Talmud even advised women, men don't even so much as greet a woman in the streets. Even if it's your wife or sister, don't greet a woman. So what changed? What changed the course of human history? Things like this. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? Will you give me a drink? I mean, what changed? Jesus arrived. That's what changed. That story from John 4 ends that many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. You know, in a day when woman's testimony was not admissible in court, Jesus took a socially outcast woman and made her into the first evangelist, the first Christian missionary. Matthew 9, just then a woman who'd been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, if only I touch his cloak, I will be healed. Jesus turned and saw her and said, take heart, daughter. Your faith has healed you. What changed? I mean, Jesus took women who were considered ritually, ceremoniously unclean, weren't even allowed in the temple, were defiling other people they came into contact with according to Jewish thought and custom. Jesus took women like this and not only healed them, but gave them honor. Your faith has healed you. After this, it says in Luke 8, 1, Jesus traveled from one synagogue or one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The 12 were with him. And also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household. Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support him out of their own means. They were paying for Jesus' mission. I mean, in a day when men were advised not even to talk to women, Jesus gathers a whole group of them for his traveling road show. And not just to fund the expedition, we also read of women sitting at Jesus' feet, apprenticing to him like disciples. Luke 10, 38, Mary sat at the feet, at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. You know, we don't notice what a shock to the system this was when we read these stories. But this, in these days, women, men were expected not even to talk to women. But if that wasn't a, you know, enough, all the accounts of Jesus interacting with women, and one of the greatest uh, claims against Christianity, one of the, the greatest criticisms of early Christianity by uh, surviving sources uh, was a response to this story out of Luke 24. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they'd prepared and went to the tomb. They found, they, these women, found the stone rolled away. It says, when they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the, to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Because of that, the ancient church decided that Mary Magdalene was an apostle to the apostles. Um, about 300 AD, they decided she's, an, she's, an, she's the first apostle. She's actually the apostle to the apostles. But that was in a day where women could not give testimony in a court of law. In that day, Jesus chose women to be the first to witness his, his, the miracle of his resurrection. Now, maybe that doesn't seem that shocking to you. I mean, we've read these stories. But Jesus is the only religious leader in the history of the world to do anything like this. I mean, it, it, the only religious leader to treat women, women with full dignity as valuable parts of his team and arguably giving them even greater prominence than men at some of these critical moments. 
I mean, you don't find these kind of stories in the accounts of Muhammad. I mean, you don't find them in the, the accounts of the life of the Buddha. Not in the Bhagavad Gita. Not in the story of Joseph Smith. Not in the stories of any of history's religious leaders do you find this sort of dignity given to women, this sort of pride of place given to women. I mean, even sadly for so much of Christian history, the example of Jesus has been neglected, you know, silenced. And listen to Dorothy Sayers. She's one of the best-loved Christian authors of the last century. She puts it this way. She says, perhaps it's no wonder that the women were the first at the cradle and the last at the cross. They had never known a man like this man. There had never been another. A prophet and a teacher who never nagged at them, never flattered or coaxed or patronized, who never made jokes about them, never treated them either as the woman, God help us, or the ladies, God bless them, who rebuked without quarrelousness and praised without condescension, who took their questions and arguments seriously, who never mapped out their sphere for them, never urged them to be feminine or jeered at them for being female, who had no ax to grind and no uneasy male dignity to defend, who took them as he found them and, and was completely unselfconscious. There is no act, no sermon, no parable in the whole gospel that borrows its pungency from female perversity. Nobody could possibly guess from the words and deeds of Jesus that there was anything funny about women's nature. He's the light of the world. Who's ever met anyone like him? Never has anyone even claimed to be like him in the history of great religious teachers, prophets, Jesus' revolutionary treatment of women, friends, it started a revolution. And it's likely the only reason you've ever heard of Christianity. See, it wasn't just that Jesus personally treated women so well. I mean, we could go on and on. And I, I know you guys would like to be here until lunchtime, but <laughs> I'll spare you all the history. But it wasn't just Jesus. It wasn't just the way he personally acted with women. His moral teaching as well so incredibly improved the lives of women and children that it, that it gave rise to a movement that was just unstoppable in the ancient world. Jesus said things like, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. These day, in these days, women were considered property to be used, to be discarded. And Jesus points the finger at men and he says, not anymore. Not anymore. I mean, in a day when men were permitted to divorce their wives for any reason whatsoever, but in a, in a time when women were not allowed to divorce their husbands for really almost any reason without a judge signing off on it, a male judge, Jesus says no more, no more, no more double standard. I mean, is it any surprise that in the early church we find women serving and leading and prophesying, even preaching, even explaining the complexities of theology, serving as deaconesses, elders, even one named as an apostle. I mean, it's not a surprise when you, the, the incredible revolutionary barrier breaking presence that Jesus offered. When Paul greets the important people in the church at Rome, the back of the book of Romans, chapter 16, he greets a whole list of peop, notable people in the church in Rome. 15 of them are women, and 18 are men, which we might say, well, that's a little out of balance. Not back then. Greeting women? Who ever heard of such a thing? You, you, could they even read? I mean, this was the perspective of the world Jesus lived in. In the, following, in the centuries that followed the, the, the ancient church, um, it, you know, it, archaeologists have found, I mean, all sorts of evidence of this, like gravestones in, under the city of Rome in the catacombs where women, just as often as men, were memorialized with big inscriptions and artwork around their tombs. I mean, the world had never seen such a thing. Not to mention, in, in the church, you know, infanticide and abortion were just quickly 
uh, deemed murder, which, which caused women to flourish. Which, uh, and as the centuries went by, the, the number of Christian women began to exceed the number of Christian men, the exact opposite of Rome. And because of that, Christian women waited much longer to marry. The average age was over 18. Hardly any married before the age of 15. And for the first time, women were given a say in who they marry. The husbands were, not, were no longer permitted to just divorce their wives over, you know, any little thing. In those days, the Christian sexual ethic made sex outside of marriage taboo. And so Christian couples began to have more children Uh, Christian women were leading their husbands to faith in such great numbers, were flourishing in such significant ways that the birth rates went up, fertility increased, family size increased, and Christianity swallowed up the world of the empire. See, the the best historians have recognized that Christianity flourished because Christianity so vastly improved the lives of women. And yet sometimes, you know, people will say, I've said it here, isn't the church still marred by patriarchy and poor treatment of women? Yes, of course. I mean, Christianity always needs to be called back to its founding principles, to its founder. I mean, the church has never arrived in 2,000 years, has it? Christianity always needs to be called back to its founding principles. But here's the thing. These are uniquely Christian principles. The the impetus to overturn patriarchy, it, it never succeeded in Greece or Rome, even though there was thinkers who attempted it. It didn't succeed in the Middle Ages, nor in the, you know, the great kingdoms of Asia. Nowhere. The ideas about the equality of men and women, they did not arise from human nature or or human philosophy or common sense. They are unique to Jesus. Now, our modern sensibilities about gender equality, I mean, you can draw a straight line from the, the, the words and the works of Jesus to modern women's liberation movements, women's suffrage, women's civil rights. You can draw a straight line from from Jesus. Now, the church took all sorts of detours, horrendous, tragic detours. But, you know, this this stuff isn't talked about very much. I think I'm guilty of it. In the church, we spend so much time talking about how much farther we have yet to go, how much work there is to do, that we don't often appreciate that the world changed, like, like overturned, upside down. The world was right-sided. Something began with Jesus that is still working itself out to this day. And it's true, the change was a long time in coming. But when we step into the work of Jesus in restoring dignity, in ending the oppression of women and children. We step into that. We're not stepping into a losing battle. We're not stepping into a hopeless cause. I mean, the reason we keep working and we keep confessing our own sin and confessing the sins of our culture and repenting and calling each other to more is because Jesus' example isn't simply the right thing to do. Jesus has started a movement that cannot be stopped. And we are now his hands and feet. I mean, we continue the work of justice and equality, but with the recognition that justice has been rolling on like a river for 2,000 years. Just like Amos said, it cannot be stopped. Justice is rolling on like a river. And there's no court of law, there's no judge, there's no politician that can stand in its way. Justice will roll on like a river. Whether our nation rises or falls, justice will roll on like a river because Jesus has come and turned the world right side up. All of history is now flowing in the direction of God's great plans. And so we rejoice even as we confess. We remember even as we anticipate the work to be done. 
Well, let's turn our hearts back to Jesus again. These aren't just founding principles. They're the words of our founder. And we, we need to be changed and inspired and reinvigorated by his story again and again. So would you stand with me? God, we thank you that you are mighty, that you are powerful, that you are not uh, weak, that you have the power to change the world, to change entire nations. And we just thank you that we get to meet with you and experience your change within us in the same place, Lord. So would you come, Holy Spirit, make us more like you, Jesus.
Lord, we believe that you are here, that you are in the room. And we believe that because those who actually stood with you in the flesh believed it. And they recognized even after you had departed, even after you ascended, that they could feel your presence. They could sense your spirit. They could hear your voice. They could see you at work. And so, Lord, would you let your kingdom come in greater ways around us? Would you bring healing and the hope and the, the freedom and the restoration that we, we read about in history? Would you bring more of that in our lives, we pray, Lord Jesus. As we close, I want to I invite um, 